Thank you very much. Well, um, since I have such a big crowd, um, this will be very intimate. If you have any questions, just stop me. <laughs> um, and I really tried to gear this towards um, most of my experiences in more of a commercial scale of poultry production, but I did try to reach out and kind of grab information for people who might be interested in doing it on a small scale. So um, here's just a picture of my farm and my three children. And uh, so I do grow chickens for uh, Coleman Natural uh, or Coleman Organic. And so uh, I have 148,000 chickens, which most of you guys heard earlier today. Uh, they are boys and girls mixed together. So they are sisters and brothers to one another. I'll grow them out to about seven weeks of age. They'll weigh about 6.8 pounds when they leave. And we usually end up with a feed conversion of about a 1.8. So you can go on you, you don't have to, but if you'd like to. If you want to hear about all things chicken. I was just taking my time. <laughs> so, um, so, and as I mentioned earlier, that typically with organic chickens, as long as the process has been implemented properly, and what that means is, is that from the standpoint of chick quality, in terms of hatchery, sanitation, if you're getting good quality chicks, it's quite feasible to do well with organic chickens and really only lose about 5% of the flock. Um, but you definitely have to have all the pieces in the puzzle lined up to have that good outcome because if you don't have good hatchery sanitation, you're going to have more issues with chick quality and, and that can really impact the outcome of the, of the, uh, the flock. So why would you want to grow chickens? Well. Uh, there's well not on a commercial scale is there minimal cash investment if you're doing on a commercial scale you're probably looking at anywhere from three to four hundred thousand dollars for a house and that is um, not including the land but that would probably take care of grading electric so if you want to build a farm the size of mine um, I built those four houses 10 years ago 10 11 years ago for about a million five hundred thousand those same houses would probably cost you closer to probably 1.8 at this point versus what it was then so um, but if you're looking at doing it on a small scale it can be very low uh, investment in terms of housing and things of that nature depending on how you want to do it so you can do it with minimal space they're easy to handle um, if you're growing them for your own use then it could be for one meal uh, you can kill a chicken as you need it and eat it uh, if you choose to um, you have control over your food you know where it comes from um, there are some stuff that can be recycled and um, and so you can think about that they have a quick life cycle, so most chickens, um, if you want to grow chickens, depending on the size you want them to be, you can have a, a chicken that's edible within five to seven weeks, it's going to be a decent size and will work well for you. Um, so they do grow fast, they're fresh and local, and whether you're growing chickens in your backyard or you're growing chickens on a commercial scale, it's probably one of the most local products you can get because the food is grown here, the chickens are hatched here, they are grown here, they are processed here. And there's not too many things that are on that scale that um, that are done that locally. So, so um, most of what we feed the chickens is uh, corn and, and there's soybeans in there. Um, you also have control of how it's raised. You can choose how you process it if you're doing a backyard flock. And so, um, so all those pieces pieces you can control them if you want to. And ultimately, what can you get from chickens if you choose to grow chickens? Well. You can certainly grow them for laying, laying hens. Um, those birds probably take about 23 weeks to probably start laying their first eggs. Um, so you might potentially want to do that. But that comes with a pretty sizable investment, mainly for the food to get those chicks, if you choose to get them at that, the day they hatch, to get the chicks from that's 23 weeks, you're really not producing anything. You're just waiting for them to become sexually mature enough to start laying eggs. You do not have to have a boy chicken to have the girl chickens lay eggs, that's not necessary. But if you do want fertilized eggs, you do need a boy chicken. So um, the other thing is that you can also have uh, meat birds if you choose to. Some birds can be for meat and eggs. Um, of course, when they become meat, they're no longer making eggs. <laughs> So, uh, so you have to think that, think about that. And oftentimes, a meat bird is or a bird that's been used to produce eggs. It's probably going to be tough uh, when you if you go to eat it. And oftentimes, what you get in Campbell's soup is old fowl that has laid eggs. And the reason why the pieces of meat are so small is because that would be the only way you'd be able to chew them. So, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, some people like chickens for show. Some people like chickens for pets. So the big thing when you talk about organic uh, poultry is that documentation in any kind of organic production is crucial and you better you have to make sure that you have all your certificates and that you have everything you need so that documentation is crucial um, 
you need to have some type of certi certification for anything that bird consumes or anything that they're going to come in contact with. And there's a lot of things you might not even think about with that. So you also, if you think about getting into the into the, the business and you're doing it on a small scale, who is actually going to be the company that's going to certify you to be organic? Um, for Coleman Natural Foods, our certifier is Oregon Tilth. And so every 15 months, they're somebody who comes and visits my farm and they go through all my record keeping, all my paperwork to ensure that I have all the documentation I need, all the certificates. And those certificates could be for the litter that I'm putting in the house. It has their certificates for the way the feed is produced. Every truckload of feed that comes to my farm has to have a ticket that has that shows that it is organic certified feed. I have to collect all those tickets and document that throughout the flock. So documentation is crucial um, in any type of organic production, but especially with with the poultry. Um, and be aware of what can prevent you from having organic certification. When I first decided I wanted to become an organic grower, I had actually used road millings, recycled asphalt around my farm as the as the uh, road material. And I had not added any material for over seven years, which thank goodness I hadn't because if I had have done that, they, have, they actually allowed me to be grandfathered in, but road millings can be considered toxic waste. And so, uh, so you do not want to, if you're even remotely considering becoming an organic farm, you do not want to use road millings as your material for that. Um, the other thing is a lot of times we think, you know, when we build stuff outside, we want to do it out of salt treated lumber. Those birds cannot be exposed to salt treated lumber. So you have to make sure that, that, you're conscientious of whatever the requirements are for organic certification. Sometimes you can make choices and do things that you think, oh, that's not really that big a deal. But those are the things you have to be mindful of that can catch you and could pre potentially prevent you from being organic. Yep. Yep. When you started out your chickens, they weren't always organic, right? That is correct. So is there like a transition period like the conventional? Great there is. For the chicken house and like how was they constructed? Does anything in there have to be changed? Well, here was the thing. At the time that I made the transition, my chicken houses were eight years old. So I hadn't added any additional milling, so I was okay there. However, I had used some Roundup around the perimeter of the chicken house. So if I, and I had stopped probably about a year before when I started considering it, but I still had two more years. Well, to speed up the process and mitigate that, they dug the soil out from around the chicken house. It was probably about a two foot band and remove that and then put the stone in. And the thing about the poultry industry is this, is that you don't want to be the first of anything and you won't be the last. Because if you want to really reap the benefit, you want to kind of get in there. You don't want to be the guinea pig when they're figuring out how to do it, but you want to get in there fairly early to try to get the most benefit out of it. Because um, eventually organic, well I hope it doesn't, eventually organic may lose some of its uh, threshold of, you know, get that more profitability as, as more of it occurs. So, but the main things that had to happen was the house had to be completely cleaned out. Everything had to be completely washed down. Um, anything used after that point had to be organic certified. Uh, the feeders had to be all cleaned out. The feed tanks had to be flushed. They brought, uh, organic, they, they brought, um, they flushed the tanks out so that there was no res residue of feed. The drinkers had to be washed. Um, everything had to be perfectly cleaned. And then from that point forward, I, I could no longer put anything in that house in or around it that was not organic certified. So uh, one of the things that we often have are these black bugs. And so we have to use uh, boric acid to control the, they're called darkling beetles, for the control of those darkling beetles. Um, rodent, rodent problems, that's a real challenge because we're really not allowed to use any rodent, rodenticides unless they're organic approved. But then even then they're not allowed in the poultry house. They have to be outside of the poultry house and outside the pasture area. So so that offers a little bit of extra challenge. Area where you can't use anything, like there's probably an area around your houses that you can't use anything like round up. Right, that's correct. And it's about a fifty like from 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 your production area, you like I think on mine it's a fifty foot band around that production area that nothing that is not organic can be used. So um, so like if I were to want to put up a pollinator plot, right, and the seed I wanted to put in, and I wanted to put it in the, in the pasture area, I wouldn't, it would have to be organic certified seed that I would put in there. If for some reason, if I needed to remove soil in my pasture area and wanted to replace the grass seed, I would have to get certified grass seed. So everything has to be certified that comes in contact with, even the stone that I get to put in, yeah. Yes, yeah, anything. And so like where I originally had had posts that had creosote on them for the lights outside, those had to be wrapped in metal to prevent the, the birds from being able to peck at them. So, so like I say, so there's things you might not think about that, that you would want to consider. So 
whether you're on a commercial scale or whether you're on a small scale, organic poultry requirements are, are what they are. They apply to both. Um, and I'm not going to read these verbatim to you, but um, basically there's a three year period in the transition. So anything basically that the chickens are going to kind of come in contact with as far as land, uh, soil, bedding, anything has to be organic certified. Is there a problem, like a lot of farms have cats and dogs, is there a problem with pets and things like that around chicken houses? Uh, I mean, it's not really a problem. Now they don't want them defecating in the in the house, and the you know you got all the chicken manure. You wouldn't think it was a big deal, but the concern is salmonella uh, is the main reason why they don't want them going to the bathroom in or around the, in the chicken house itself. But um, you know my black lab decided to go through the little door, you know, and I wonder where he where he went, and that's where he was. <laughs> it was in the chicken house. So um, he's a good dog for birds um, and he found a couple that he wanted to play with in there so you know so he, I mean so that's gonna happen sometimes I actually had a pretty bad issue with a fox about uh, it's probably been about six months ago now but I had a fox that wreaked havoc in my chicken house for a while so that can be a challenge as well as foxes and uh, and um, things like that so uh, the origin of the livestock so if you're gonna get chicks for your farm um, you want to make sure that they've been they don't have to necessarily come from an organic hatchery but um, they have to be under continuous organic management from their second day of life so there could be some things that occur before they hatch but once they get to their second day of life then everything thereafter has to be um, organic and the chickens I grow everything is organic at that point anyways because um, they used to use gendamycin to um, spray the eggs to reduce any um, bacteria or it was an antibiotic basically and so they they're not allowed to use that anymore um, but I guess theoretically, according to this, maybe you could, but they totally took that out of the mix. So, and so I made mention, some of you may have heard where with the eggs, they actually wipe them with baby wipes now to try to reduce any contamination that could occur while in the um, setter and the hatcher. With a baby wipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a big investment in baby wipes. <laughs> So the feed, the feed has to be 100% certified organic. It has to be grown on organic soil. Um, like I say, anything that that bird comes in comp, contact with or consumes um, is something that it has to be organic certified. Any supplements. One of the things that we use for health for the birds is copper sulfate and citric acid. It helps with the gut health of the bird. So like all that has to be organic certified. Um, so any supplements, any additives, all that has to be certified. So healthcare, um, you have to make sure that you're doing everything you can to create um, a good environment for the bird, um, that you're really, you're very conscientious of the environment that's in the bird, around the bird. You have to keep a low stress level. Um, and so that's why you, in organic poultry, we've actually reduced the density that they're placed on because that helps reduce stress. So, and you wanna make sure that you're doing what you need to do to prevent um, stress to the bird from a health standpoint. And that can be quite limiting with organic because in organic, you're also antibiotic free. And there are some things that birds can have like coccidiosis that from a health standpoint can be challenging. There's no way to treat it. You just have to try to soothe the bird through it because all those things are considered antibiotics. So uh, the living conditions, the houses must provide adequate ventilation. So we have to keep the ammonia under 25 parts per million. You wanna make sure you have an adequate clean supply of water. Um, you have to have proper sanitation. Uh, they have to have access to the outdoors. Uh, they must be provided shade and they must have exercise areas. Uh, and they have to have, to have the opportunity to have direct sunlight year round. Huh? Yeah, and I'm gonna show you. Yeah, they got, little, they got toys. Yes, so they, they do have toys. And the housing must provide a, a situation for them that they're yeah. Huh? No, I'm not joking. These chickens have toys. Yeah, they have, and they're called enrichments because they help enrich their life. So, so record keeping, uh, you got to make sure you keep uh, all your feed receipts and certificates. Um, you want to make sure that uh, any forages, bedding, straw, you have certificates and receipts for that. Sales records, so like on, on a commercial scale, that's going to be your weight tickets leaving the farm. But if you're selling your organic poultry to somebody, then you have to have record of, of, of that sale. Um, production records, anything associated with the chickens, mortality and call records. And so, um, like I say, my experience is more with the commercial scale, but here's options of like, if you wanted to get into the uh, small scale poultry production, there's free range, there's pastured poultry, semi-intensive yard and crop, some of the different kinds. Um, but pasture poultry is basically, it's, a, it's used to describe a free range bird that's allowed to eat pasture. Um, they'll be, uh, they're screened in and, and protected from, uh, 
uh, predators and things like that. But this is something that would be need to need to be moved because the birds will actually eat all the grass and turn it into a, just a dirt area. Free range um, refers to that an operation where you can move the house, and so it's a little a little bit different, but kind of the same. It, they're not confined like they were in the previous picture, um, but it does allow the birds the outdoor access, and then. Kind of in a, they, they don't really roam real. F it, I think it depends on the breed. Some are more adventurous than others, but um, for the most part, they'll kind of stay pretty close. They're going to stay close to where their food and water sources. Um, a lot of times in the commercial scale, people have a vision that the poultry house is not this nice environment. And when you open the doors, that the chicken, my chicken house has 15 doors down the side of the house, that they're all lined up on the ramps, ready to make this mass exodus out of the house. And that's just not true. At most, I might see 10 to 15 chickens outside. And usually that's gonna be, huh? Uh, well, sometimes they'll come out when the sun's coming up. Like if you, if you get out there early, they're more likely to be out early in the day and real late in the day. But they're not gonna be out there when the sun's at its peak. Um, I have been told, I've not observed this for myself, but if the doors face, if you have two chicken houses and the doors face each other, they're more likely to come out because they're naturally curious and I'll just like, hey, you know, and they look at each other and they'll come out and do that. But, um, but my houses are not set up that way. So uh, the picture on the, on the far side there is actually one of the doors open on the side of the poultry house. And you can see there's like three or four chickens standing there um, kind of looking around. But like I said, they don't really go that far out and there are shade structures a little further out about 10 feet from the house that they can go out there and get under shade and and feel comfortable now one thing i do live fairly close to dover air force base and so i think every so often there's a big c-130 that goes over that maybe they think is a hawk and that's why they don't really want to go out all that much but um but they they are you know but they have outdoor access if they want to go outside <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then on, on the right side here, you can see where uh, that is the fenced in area. It's a little difficult to see, um, but that is the pasture area. And each house has its own pasture area. So um, now another thing to consider is if you do want to do a backyard flock or a small scale flock, one of the things that we're doing in commercial is we are what's called GAP certified, and that's Global Animal Partnership. And so what GAP is, is that it was actually a company that was kind of set up by Whole Foods as a way of cert certifying that the whatever protein products were sold at Whole Foods met these certain animal welfare requirements. The interesting thing is, and the thing that you always have to keep in the back of your mind, is that the people who are on the board of directors for GAP are actually vegetarians. And so we have people who are vegetarians who are actually telling us how to grow protein, animal protein. So, you know, you, if, you have a, if you have a business, you want to decide, do I want to become GAP certified? Um, so that, that's one other stamp of approval you can kind of put on the product that you're selling. Um, and for some people, that adds value. So. Um, yeah, there's gap, yeah, but it's global animal partnership, yeah. and they and they will actually dictate to the grower. This is where the windows, like that, you're going to have so many windows. You're going to have to have like, like organic doesn't say you have to have. Uh, they have to say you have to have pasture area. Doesn't necessarily give you any requirements of that pasture area. Gap goes a step further and says part of that pasture area, the shade can't be something man-made, it has to be a natural structure. So, yes. So if you want that stamp of approval. And to me, it's kind of a way to try to whittle away a little bit at, it's to try to make it more difficult to do animal agriculture. Um, but you've got, the, these guys are putting a lot of pressure on like the Chick-fil-A's, the McDonald's, and they're, they're going to them and saying, you know, if you don't, if you don't start using GAP certified products, then we're gonna come protest in front of you or Chick-fil-A. Well, nobody wants that publicity. So, so they they're being quite effective with that, with what they're doing. So, so the enrichments are another piece of that. So these are examples of some of the toys for the chickens in the chicken house. Um, the one to the left there is called a bully box, and so the birds will kind of stand on the perimeter of that. Some will jump in, and if a chicken's getting bullied, I guess theoretically he could jump in there. I don't know what keeps the bully chicken from getting in with him, but. They have, that's one of the enrichments that they have, and then also the ramps. And so when the birds are chicks, they really do like the ramps and they'll kind of climb up on them and jump off. And, but it gives them some natural habitat to kind of mill about in uh, their, their normal behavior. And so that's why they're there. So 
breed. So you, what you got to think about if you're going to get into some type of poultry enterprise is uh, what's, what's your ultimate goal? Like as your goal is to, to have the birds lay eggs, is it to have meat? Um, and so depending on what your goal is, you may choose a leghorn if you want eggs. Uh, if you want a meat bird, you're probably going to get a Cornish cross. Um, if you want a dual purpose bird that kind of gives you both, then you want a Rhode Island red. So when you're starting out, um, if you're considering, okay, well, how, how do I want to set my enterprise up? You may say, well, chicks are the least expensive way to get into it because you're buying a baby chick and it's probably going to cost maybe 50 cents, 25 to 50 cents, depending on where you get it from. So you're going to get it probably the day, a couple of days, maybe within a day or two of it hatching. Um, when you do that bird, it's less likely to bring disease, um, but it's going to require the most care because you're going to have to have a certain temperature to keep the bird comfortable. So it's a little more challenging. If you get birds that have already been started, um, that could be a good deal if you can find them, but that can be good for a laying flock because you've not put all the investment of the money of the feed into them prior to getting them. And it also may save you some time. Um, but uh, it, that is going to be a little more expensive as far as buying the bird. So like I say, you got to decide what you want to do and what your goals are. Um, you can buy birds that are already sexually mature. They're going to be the most expensive because somebody's probably already invested in feeding them for 23 weeks. But you're going to get the fewest surprises because that bird is, is probably already established and less likely to have issues that you wouldn't be aware of. So you can have different housing depending on what you're trying to accomplish or what your interests are. But the things you want to consider in that housing is what your space requirements are, uh, what the needs will be for the birds, uh, the bedding material you're going to choose, how are you going to manage your biosecurity, how easy is it going to be to clean out, is it going to be able to be kept, keep the birds dry, Will you be able to keep it clean? Are they going to be safe from predators? So these are all the pieces that you are going to need electricity. So these are just some of the pieces you're going to want to consider if you think about um, doing uh, a poultry enterprise. So and then feed, the feed must be certified organic. Um, birds have different needs at different ages. And so you want to make sure that you pick feed rations that are specific to that age bird and what you're trying to accomplish. A meat bird is going to have a different requirement than a bird laying eggs. And so just be mindful of that if you want to, whichever direction you want to go. Water, chickens are going to drink about twice, they're going to drink about twice as much water as feed as they're going to eat. So you want to make sure that you have water that's palatable, it's readily available, it's free of manure and bacteria. And chlorinating the water is an acceptable practice and is actually recommended because it reduces any um, bacterial challenges to the birds. So health, and I'm going to skip health and I'm just going to go to prevention. Um, and really when you talk about organic, and this is commercial or small small flock is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure benjamin franklin said that and you really do have to think that way because as this as our industry has made the transition to more antibiotic free chickens um you have to be much more proactive if the birds are sick and, and you're growing in an ABF or organic program, you're gonna be very, there's not a whole lot you're gonna to do to treat them. So you wanna do everything you can for, to prevent that from occurring. And, um, and so there's things we can do to try to soothe the bird's gut, but they're like say, just you have, really have to be mindful of that. Um, hatchery sanitation, I already mentioned that. Chick quality and feed quality are crucial. Uh, water sanitation, that's doing that chlorination of the drinkings, or the water they're drinking. Litter conditioning. You're not going to do probably a lot of litter conditioning on a small scale, but when you talk about a big poultry house, there's things we do in between flocks to try to make sure the litter has the opportunity to get dried out and to help purge some of the ammonia out. And also, if we windrow it, we're able to reduce disease pathogens that are within that litter. So those are some of the options for litter conditioning. Um, equipment maintenance and this would be on a commercial scale, but if you have a feed line that keeps running out of feed over and over and over again, that will nickel and dime you to death in terms of weight gain for a commercial chicken. And so probably that little piece of equipment might only cost five bucks to fix this little rubber flapper in the control pan, can cost you exponentially in terms of weight gain and in terms of feed conversion. So I uh, talked about wind rowing, also helps with bugs. So. One of the things I recommend to any poultry farmer is that you want to become an expert in poopology. And, uh, and basically what that is is that it's good to know what a normal looking dropping looks like versus an abnormal. So these three droppings are good, uh, good, that's what a good poop should look like. 
okay? Um, they should have a white cap on them. Um, sometimes if the bird is doing more pasture fed, it's gonna be a little greener. That's gonna be the color of the, um, the dropping. But if it looks like these, th these are signs that the bird is having some enteric issues. And so at that point, you have to make a decision, you know, is there something I can do to help this bird soothe that bird's gut? In some cases, run a little bit of vinegar, apple cider vinegar will help this situation because it'll help tighten up the gut. Um, sometimes run a little bit of copper sulfate and citric acid. And those things are approved methods for organic poultry to try to soothe them through that time. Um, it's not that you necessarily need to know which bird, because you're not going to treat an individual bird. What you would do is you would add it to the water, the drinking system, and you would go ahead and you would make the assumption, especially with coccidiosis, if a couple of them have it, there, you know, there's 20 to 50% 50, 50 of them could have it. And so depending where they are at in the cycle, um, so that soothing of their gut, hopefully they wouldn't get to this stage, um, is what you would hope for. So um, starting out, if you're gonna start out a, a small poultry entity, buy 25% more birds than you think you'd really need, need because um, you could have some mortality. It's, you're gonna have mortality normally, and you may wanna do some culling on birds that are not uh, developing properly. The most huma humane way to euthanize a chicken that's not developing properly is cervical dislocation. Um, that is the most humane way to euthanize a bird. So which is, is a it's quick and fairly painless, as painless as it can be. Um, for laying flocks, you want to decide how many eggs you ultimately want to get, um, and that will help you determine what your, flocks, what your flock size should be. Um, so estimate about two eggs a day for, uh, for three hens and a flock. So that just gives you a little bit of a starting point if you're trying to decide how many you would need. You always want to have less, um, if you're if you're raising birds for meat, then it's okay to have boy chickens. But if you have girl chickens and you're laying, they're laying eggs, you don't have too many boys because the boys will have a tendency to fight and they'll, they will end up killing each other. You don't see that in normal broiler flocks or your small commercial flocks because the birds aren't sexually mature. But as the birds become more sexually mature, they, the males do become much more aggressive. So bird health. Um, really, it's best in, in a commercial flock. We do have this philosophy of all in, all out and not to have multiple ages of flocks on an individual farm, because you do drastically increase the chances of getting a disease. Um, but that can be difficult on a small, small scale operation. So, you know, whether you have 100 birds, you know, 100 bird pins, and you try to keep them isolated that way, um, you, you know, you want to try best you can to have that mindset, or at least limit the exposure to each other as far as diseases. Um, if you do have sick birds, you do want to quarantine them and keep them away from the other birds and make sure that they, they you know, they have feed and water and uh, the pastures. And you may need to move them around to make sure that they're not being exposed to other birds. So, what can you expect to get out of a, of a, a poultry flock? Um, normally, for every pound of meat, it takes about two pounds of feed. Um, so, chickens are one of the most efficient animals at taking feed and making body weight. The only other animal more efficient than a chicken is a fish, and a fish is pretty much one-to-one -one ratio. So, uh, so if you've got, it's going to take about 10 pounds of feed to get five pounds of weight on that bird. Now, commercially grown chickens are a little better than that. We can probably get, it's probably about a 1.8 pounds of feed to one pound of meat. Um, for eggs, for 150 to 300 um, eggs per year, it's going to take about three to four pounds of feed for every dozen of eggs. So just keep that in mind, and feed is your biggest cost, your biggest expense when it comes to growing chickens. Um, it's probably going to run, it's probably going to be about 80% of the cost of growing chickens. And organic feed is much more expensive, probably by two to three times as much as conventional feed. Georgia, do you know um, what the organic feed situation is for poultry as far as how much do we produce domestically versus imported? Like, are we producing enough domestically? Oh, no, no, no. We, the majority of it for the poultry, I mean, like, and Purdue's really put a big push to try to get encouraging people to do it here. But the reality, I, I can't tell you what the number is, but the majority of it comes from Argentina and Turkey is where the organic grain comes from that makes the poultry feed. So, so, see. so Who's certifying their organic standards? Like, does USDA step in at some point before it comes in? I know that there was, and I'm not sure exactly what happens at the port. I know that they can do some testing to ensure that it's not GM, you know, it doesn't have any GMOs and stuff like that in it. Um, I know there was, uh, they there was, and I don't know how they do it, but at one point there was some that was grown in California that were they were shipping by rail car over here, and it got here and they tested it and declined it because it was not what it was supposedly 
supposed to be. So, um, so there are there's testing they can do, but what that exactly is, I'm not 100% sure. So. Um, so you just want to make sure whatever state laws you have, whether you're in Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, make sure that you're following whatever your state recommendations are. There are some places, my mom lives in the city of Dover, you're allowed to have 25 chickens in the city of Dover in city limits. So, you know, just make sure that you're uh, complying with whatever the area, your area's laws are. So when it comes to the organic standards, some of the things that you want to keep in mind. So if you're doing, if you're producing eggs or whether you're processing, well, you wouldn't really be able to process your own birds because you have to have an organic certified processing plant to process them, to sell them as organic uh, meat. But um, you do have to want to be mindful of if you're um, going to use, um, if you're going to be cleaning the carcasses or the eggs, that you got to make sure you use cleaners that are considered organic. So don't get, like sometimes those are those little things you don't really think about. Um, so make sure that you check the national list of, of um, items that you can use for that, for, for cleaning. Um, so water used in direct harvest for contact with eggs or carcasses washing is permitted to contain chlorine. Um, materials at levels approved by the drug, Food and Drug Administration for EPA. And that's about three parts per million, but if it exceeds that, then you have to wash it with water to drop it below that. So. So keep in mind that. Um, there are different types of egg wash ingredients, so sodium hypochlorite, potassium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, sodium, bar bar sodium carbonate, and parasitic acid. Those are approved for egg washes. Mineral oil is not on the approved list, so if you wanna shine your eggs up, do not use mineral oil, but you can use organic vegetable oil to shine your eggs up and make them look nice. So, so. Yeah, so those are things that you just don't think about, but you want to be mindful of. Slaughter, um, bottom line is, if you were gonna label the, the meat to be organic, then it has to be um, slaughtered at an organic approved slaughterhouse. So it has to be certified. Marketing. Okay, you get an egg that hasn't been washed? Like, yeah, well, are you gonna cook it? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you just, like I buy, dozen eggs from my neighbor and they go back to our flock. Mm -hmm. And they say they'll wash them whatever. I don't know what they wash them with. You turn on wash it, okay, just crack it and fry it. Yeah, yeah, it's not gonna hurt. I mean, it's not gonna hurt you. I mean, like, I mean, as long as you cook it the right temperature, even if there's some chicken manure in it, it's not gonna hurt you. You know what I mean? Like, you know I mean? you cook it to the right temperature, just a little, you know, yeah, just a little seasoning. No, yeah, so I mean, as long as it's cooked properly, and that's the key with any type of poultry, cook to the proper temperature, Salmonella isn't an issue, but it's handling and cooking that really becomes the issue. So, marketing and labeling. Um, the following information must be included on the label if you're going to market your product. The handler information, the name of the handler, and the business address. Um, and it can be followed by a certified organic buy, and that would identify the, the uh, entity that is your uh, certifier. So like where I grow organic chickens for Coleman, um, the actual certifier is um, Oregon... I said it earlier, organ something, or organ tilt is the name of the place that actually does the certifying. So that would actually be stamped on the label as well. So you wanna include that information. Um, you can also, once you've done that, you can also stamp on there that it is 100% organic and then you can put the USDA seal on it as well. Um, the other things that are really important, especially on a small scale, even on a large scale, is that whatever storage areas, anything that's in close proximity to the chickens that may be considered organic, is it needs to be free of anything that's not organic. And so you wanna make sure, you wanna keep your food room clean, keep rodents out um, best that you can, um, trash cans, make sure that they're being emptied frequently, disinfectants, um, only have organic stuff in those areas. Because if, if you get audited and they come out and they see that stuff, they can cite you for that. And it could potentially jeopardize your organic certification. Um, something that's really important regardless of whether you're growing commercial chickens or uh, backyard flock is biosecurity. There's nothing I can stress more than biosecurity. At this point in time, there is uh, an outbreak of avian influenza in Minnesota. There's a farm that has 20,000 turkeys that actually has been confirmed to have AI that's been depopulated. Um, and I think I might have seen something where there's something might be going on in Texas. So the concern with that is this, is that um, if that were to happen on Delmarva, that Minnesota farm, there's two farms within six mile radius. If that would help happen on Delmarva, there would be 30 to 90 farms within that six mile radius. And so we certainly don't want that here. We are fortunate that we don't have such older poultry being grown here, like turkeys and, and egg laying birds for the most part. We don't have a big population of that. Um, but we have to be very, very conscientious of biosecurity and to ensure that we don't 
get avian influenza here because it, it would be catastrophic. So, so uh, make sure that you always have dedicated clothing, wash your hands, always try to follow a pattern, have one entrance and exit, avoid wild birds. You have to assume that one in five migratory fowl have avian influenza. So if that were the case, would you send your kid to the playground if you knew one in five kids had the flu, right? So here comes a little bit of a, a dilemma, right? Is that we have organic chickens they're supposed to have outdoor access. Well, as a person, when I step into my chicken house, I actually step in a chlorine bath before I walk in. If I allow my chickens outside, they don't step in a chlorine bath before they come back in. So there's a little bit of, you know, there's a bit of a dilemma there. And when we have had times, I remember back in 2015, when there was a big, that big outbreak in the Midwest, we actually got a, a, a thing where it said that we didn't have to allow them to go out and they could still be organic certified. So like I say, be mindful of those things. There's nothing, like I say, it's very, very important. Weather for chickens is a huge factor. One of the biggest problems if you're doing it on a small scale and you don't have proper facilities and housing is that the rain can wreak havoc on the birds because um, the birds get wet and cold. Um, that's really bad for young birds because they really, they can't thermoregulate themselves. So uh, they'll sometimes snuggle together to keep warm. The problem with that is they will actually snuggle together so much they will actually kill each other and suffocate each other by getting on top of one another. So, um, so be mindful of that, that you need to be able to have a you yeah, need to have enough space facility that if it is getting cool and it's getting to freezing temperatures that you need to be able to keep it warm enough that they're comfortable that they don't do that. So they don't go outside in the winter? Maybe? They can go outside in the winter. Now the requirement for the chickens I grow is the outside temperature or excuse me, the, the, the inside temperature the goal of what you have, okay, has to be equal to or warmer. The outside temperature has to be equal to or warmer than whatever your goal temperature is inside. So if my temperature inside is supposed to be 70. As long as it's 70 or above, chickens are allowed outside and they have to be three weeks old. So um, they are looking to change that requirement that it may go to the birds are allowed out once they're four weeks old, but when it's 40 degrees or above, which that's going to be very challenging because when you open the house up like that, you no longer really have control of what the, you, you lose consistency. And really, chickens will do best and are most comfortable. The more consistent you can keep the environment, the better off they are, so, and the more productive they're gonna be. So, um, the other thing that can wreak havoc on birds is when it gets really hot. Um, that can be really stressful. When the temperature gets above 90 degrees, birds pant, they don't sweat, so it's harder for them to thermoregulate themselves, or it's hard for them to get rid of all that extra heat. So, um, it can be very challenging for them, especially as they're adult birds when it gets above 90 degrees. Predators, I mentioned foxes. Um, you wanna to try to keep your, one of the challenges with free range poultry is, is foxes, hawks, um, different birds of prey, different owls, an owl, if an owl's around, he'll actually rip the head off the chicken and leave it, he doesn't need it, just leaves it. Um, I had a fox get in one of my chicken houses and killed almost a thousand chickens over probably a five day period. And um, at first I thought I had a rat problem because it was just these little bite marks on the chickens. Um, but I set up a deer camera and figured out what was the real problem. And so, um, and he just, he found a way in the chicken house. And so, so you have to be very conscientious of that, conscientious, conscientious of that as well. So, um, management, it's very important with poultry as with any kind of business is to make sure you keep records of what you're doing. Um, so you can figure out what's working and what's not. Because if you can't measure it, um, then you can't really manage it. And so uh, you want to make sure that you're keeping those records and you can determine whether is this, is this uh, project, is it making money? Is it sustainable? Is it worth its while? Because sometimes you have to ask yourself, you know, is it worth the investment or not? And sometimes you have to cut your losses. But um, so you want to make sure you're keeping track of those records. So. So does anybody have any questions or anything that, uh, um, it, I, I believe it has been worth it going organic for me. Basically, um, I'm growing broilers, chickens, which are seven week chickens for roaster money, which would have been a nine week chicken. So that's the first thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm making the same amount of money growing a seven week chicken versus a nine week chicken. Plus I'm getting an extra flock a year. So it's probably increased my income probably by about 25%, I would say. With a, with all the requirements associated with it, um, I would say I probably have increased my probably 20 to 25 percent. And of course, it did come at a cost because I did have to, I had to retrofit my existing houses. And what that involved was is there did have to be windows installed. I have 22 windows in each house. The lean tos with the little doors had to be put in place, and the shade structures and the toys. And that was a, and then I had to mitigate where that Roundup had been sprayed at one point in time. But yeah, I would say it's been well worth it. I do, I really do. I'm not joking when I say I love growing these chickens because 
um, the natural light for me mainly not I don't even know that the natural light is that great for the the chickens, but I know psychologically for me, it's a lot better environment to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and they are more active, they do play more. <clears throat> so the idea is that it does help improve and lessen leg issues for the chickens if they're not as sedentary. So, but it's been a good, it's been a good move um, for me. And so, um, and that come, and again, it was, it was all about looking at if we're gonna go to a system that's more antibiotic free and you're not gonna have that crutch there anymore, why not move yourself up on the value chain so you make more money for that additional risk. And that's what it really, really boils down to. And, and to be quite honest, I don't think there's anything wrong with eating regular old chicken. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's a place for, for you know, all, all different types of production. And they can coexist and whatever the consumer wants is what we can do. So, so with feed being one of the biggest costs in raising chickens, and you're telling Susan that most of the feed for you is coming from Argentina and Turkey, do you push these conventional growers to try and... Well, I think Purdue is encouraging people to try to... Yeah, I think they really are. Me, I, not as an individual, um, like I, I try to be pretty neutral in extension because I, I don't, when I talk to people, like I, I try to help people no matter who you grow for. And so my job is not to, to be critical or to push one thing over another. It's I just wanna help people be successful. And so, um, like if somebody questions me about something, like I can go to maybe a Mount Air farm who's struggling with performance. And the, the, the nature of how we raise chickens really, no matter what company you grow for, the chickens are chickens. And so what's good for an organic chicken is really good for a regular chicken. The same principles apply from a ventilation standpoint and those things, so. But I've not really, you know, gone out and tried to like drive home, you know, you should do, and, and I really don't feel like, there is a need for it, and it may be a way for people to move themselves up into that market and add value to their product. Because, you know, grain market, grain grain farmers aren't getting rich. You know what I mean? So, um, so if if you can do that, and if you can, main if you can handle that three three year transition, is like, like just thinking about my dad, for example, and where he is. Like if he if I were to somehow, which is not going to happen, because it'd be like talking that wall probably, but get him to transition <laughs> to organic grain, the sh the farm across the street is conventional. That does the surrounding area have to be? You have to have some buffer around you. And that's really the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's really the challenge on Delmarva is that we're not we're not places where the, the, there's fields that are 500 acres, right? We got, you know, 100 acres here and 50 acres there and 70 acres there. So that, that, that does give us a bit of a challenge as far as making that work. And so, you know, if you could have a conglomerate of farmers that would agree to something of that nature, but that is... That's, That's a been a discussion with the new dicamba beans that if there's a spray drift issue mm -hmm. onto organic ground, mm -hmm. then that ground has to be taken out of organic for three years. Mm -hmm. It goes back into... Yeah, so it's really, it is a challenge. And when you go to places like Brazil, where one farmer owns 17,000 acres, right? You know, it's a different, it's a different ball game. And so, um, so that, that is a challenge. And if we could solve that, that would be a great thing because why not have that corn and soybeans come from here? But I do really think that is a challenge here because it's just, it's, we're just more small scale. So, so any other questions or? I try to talk crap, talk fast, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> chicken wrap. Tricky, 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 tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> I don't have it all worked out yet. I, t I keep writing down the words for my rhyme, but um, I keep losing it because, like I said, I write it on, a, on an envelope and it's in my car. I don't know if any of you do that when you're traveling along, and I'm yeah. like, I come up with all these ideas. Well, I sent Jenny a copy of my. Um, I think it was a bad sample. I've got to go back. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, like, I think I got a really, like, I think what the sample, and Charlie Dempsey was the one that took it. They got a very representative sample, and he, he just raved about how good was the that out of your pile or in your it, He took it straight out of the chicken house. Okay. So, so I'm interested. The and pile we took from was the first year organic, and it was, it's been piled outside all winter. Gotcha. So I think maybe it just... Yeah, because I took a picture of what, what Charlie had sent me. That was probably, he probably scooped that right out of the truck after they loaded it on a truck. Right. And now that was two years, that litter was two years old, and I'd never removed any litter from the house. And the only things I'd ever done was uh, 
litter, litter yeah. pulverize, okay. and windrow. Okay. So there's the only two practices I so ever. So as, as an organic grower, what is your clean? Do you have clean out different clean out requirements? Well, no, not it's well, yes and no. When I first started in organic, we supposedly were going to clean out every, every two year. years. Every year. Okay. Then we then then they couldn't get product for a, they couldn't get any ammonia control product. Okay. So then we ended up the first year I was organic, I cleaned out after the first year. And then they started getting ammonia control product again. Right. So then I went two years. So that's, that was at the end of the two years. The challenge was when I got to those, like that, that end of that year and a half, I started seeming to have more issues um, as far as, so I actually, that's when I decided to buy a wind rower. And I do think the wind rower was, was helpful. Now, if you only have litter for a year, is it worth it to buy a wind rower? And you're growing a seven week chicken? That's a harder one to justify, I th I, in my mind. Um, do you need a crust, a cruster, and all that? I don't think you need a cruster. Like, a, and that's the thing is that poultry farmers getting into this can really over-equip themselves because, and the problem is, is that the first challenge is, is that the only way you have control over your litter conditioning is if you do it yourself, right? Right? Because you can timing. But the second piece is, is that an integrator today might want you to win row. And next week they might want you to crust out. And the next week they might want you to litter safe. And, and, and it's not like you're not talking about a five thousand dollar piece of wood. You're talking about fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. So, so that's the that's kind of the. Well, I was interesting from a field crop perspective. Oh, you, you know, as far as nutrient content, you know, we're writing this management plan. Mm -hmm. Our planner came in and he's like, "Oh, this looks like beef manure." Mm -hmm. The analysis <laughs> looks like, like uh, and so production. we're going to go back to the sample and see. Animal. I would be. She's like, okay, right? She's like, can you that, like, that, you know? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm taking another you couple hundred years to breed that trade <laughs> in. I mean, well, so the, we're not sure other trades about efficiency. You know, I'm asking them on what is it different? Frame and everything. Is the production practice is different? Is it different? different? Mm -hmm. Is it just the could be a good example? Most likely, it's been lost. I mean, it's been raining. You know, so I just feel like which you might see is there. I'm all for it. Yeah, you just literally. You know, but that's my personal opinion. She's just very opposed to it. Um, but they didn't think her. At two times, didn't just like <laughs> of what she was just being back. Yeah, I was like, well, I don't want to do it. I'm just like the other back. Because even with like, there is, that's a hard one to explain. You know what I mean? Yeah. As far unless 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 for some reason, let's say he had a flood and he had to go throw some new shavings in, right. and he had to catch where right. there was you know only a flock or two's worth of you know yeah. and it was highly diluted. <laughs> so I mean, I'm trying to figure out. I've been asking them real. So yeah, the production practices are not that different. Okay. Um, now, one thing, theoretically, in my mind, in a way, I think roaster manure might have a little higher level only because. They're bigger longer. birds and they're, they're longer, okay. and so you're getting a greater concentration. <coughs> um, but you're moving more flocks with the others, so you know right. maybe maybe a wash, and that. So interesting. Because I, at one point in time they said like every flock deposits about two to three inches of manure at a okay. flock. Um, so you know, if, so I would think that would be a concentration. You know what I mean? Like so I, in a way I think with bigger chickens it ought to be higher. But I think you I think the sample I sent. Jenny, the, that analysis That's was a good sample. A good one. Okay. Yeah, and my litter was very dry. I mean, I keep okay. dry, and I don't have a lot of moisture. Like said, this has been sitting outside all year, so okay. we're gonna get a couple more samples and see what we see. Really I think the figure it out. Moved to green and have been rejected because they determined that they're I'm not organic. But I don't know to what much. level. Well, it's Friday. They're ready to roll. You know what I mean? And and I think really, these folks <coughs> probably are looking for more of a small scale. Yeah. <coughs> and I don't, and I don't have as much experience with that. I'm trying to get better, um, but I'm not as knowledgeable about the smaller scale. We had, um, <coughs> I had a night meeting.